All right. How about now? Um, yes. Better? Woohoo! All right. <laughs> Stop. Stop yeah. it. The dog agrees. Oh. All is well. Um, okay. We're going to chant again. How about that? We have a request. Is that okay with people? <laughs> okay. We're going to mute people again. Um, please let us know when and if it goes wrong, because it probably will. All right. Just a second. Screen, go, go. Ajahn, come on. Now let us make the four boundless qualities shine forth. I will abide pervading one quarter with a heart imbued with loving kindness. Likewise the second, likewise the third, likewise the fourth, so above and below, around and everywhere, and to all as to myself, I will abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a heart imbued with loving-kindness, Abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will, I will abide pervading one quarter with a heart imbued with compassion. Likewise, the second, likewise, the third, likewise, the fourth. So above and below, around and everywhere, and to all as to myself, I will abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a heart imbued with compassion, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, Without hostility and without ill will, I will abide pervading one quarter with a heart imbued with gladness. Likewise the second, likewise the third, likewise the fourth, so above and below, around and everywhere. And to all as to myself, I will abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a heart imbued with gladness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. I will abide pervading one quarter with a heart imbued with equanimity. Likewise the second, likewise the third, likewise the fourth, so above and below, around and everywhere, and to all as to myself. I will abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a heart imbued with equanimity, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. Can people hear us okay now? Just to make sure. You can type it into the chat. I'm assuming no news is good news. Great, okay, good. Wave at us frantically again if things go wrong, which they probably will. <laughs> um, so welcome all to our Saturday, uh, the January 8th retreat, Coronavirus, a cure to dealing socially distanced. We'd initially planned on having this in person at Fontelroy Church um, 
along with a live streamed YouTube aspect. And then ironically, I got coronavirus yesterday morning and we, or rather I tested positive and we had to cancel the in-person aspect. Um, and Ajin Kovilo and I had been in such close contact um, that we kind of just decided, yeah, and he's feeling a bit sick anyways. And we, yeah, um, so here we are together. <laughs> so um, we're having is, so we decided to move it onto Zoom as much as we could along with YouTube. If you are tuning into the YouTube live stream and want to join the Zoom aspect, you can navigate to Clear Mountain's website, clearmountainmonastery.org, uh, go to the calendar page, and on the calendar, you'll find the event for January um, 8th. And under that event, if you click through all the links, uh, basically, you, you will find the Zoom link. It's uh, hidden there. So apologies, that's a bit convoluted, but it's the best we have right now. Anything else on that note, Ajahn? No? Yeah, OK. Um, so we're really glad people could still join us for this. Um, it's probably for the best that we're, uh, you know, all remaining safe and, and all that. I'm doing just fine, as you can tell. I have a bit of a cold. Um, but yeah, we were happy to have um, everyone still joining. We have a lot of people on right now, 42 on Zoom and a few on YouTube as well. So it's great to see the community. Mm -hmm. We wanted to have this retreat because Ajin Kovilo is here in Seattle for um, about a month and maybe two more weeks. One more week, Ajin? About a week. Yeah. Okay, good. How's it been? It's been great. It's been filled with lots of all four divine abidings, which we'll talk about today. And um, yeah, I've been very moved, actually, by uh, uh, the whole community. I mean, it's wonderful to be up here with Tan Nisabo after uh, kind of having a long distance relationship um, from California where I'm currently in school. Um, but yeah, being on going on alms round every day. And um, yeah, it's it's really a beautiful community that's that's coming together. And that that aspect of beauty is is something which uh, is really uh, intermingled with these mm. these four divine bindings. So yeah, thank you for inviting me up here. Yeah, really, we're all very happy to have you. Um, so the schedule for the day is uh, we will begin with a brief introduction um, and then Ajahn Kobila will lead a guided meditation. The schedule should be found um, under that uh, same place. I, I referenced the Zoom link. So, um, and actually Ajahn Kobila, yeah, you can find it. Um, and uh, basically the uh, under the event, under the calendar, January 8th, um, if you go to that and click through there, you should find the schedule. Uh, I'll give a brief introduction, then Ajahn Kobi will lead a guided meditation and then give a talk. We'll have a lunch break um, and then at 12.30 p.m. we'll begin again. Aya Chittananda, who's a wonderful uh, bhikkhuni friend and uh, companion of ours from Karuna Buddhist Vihara will be zooming in to give a talk then from 1230 to one. From one to two, we'll have a group Q&A where basically um, we'll have the chance for all those monastics present to answer questions. And then after that, we'll have some more meditations and talks you may not need to use the full lunch break for lunch, in which case we encourage you to meditate and use all the time you can. As you listen to talks, please consider that time to meditate as well. And we'll post the uh, link to the schedule in the chat as well now. So I'll begin with a brief talk now that we have this going. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samha sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samha sambuddhasa. 
Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Buddhang dhammang sanghang namasana So the qualities we're speaking to today are in Pali referred to as the Brahma Viharas, which translates as the abodes of the Brahma, the Brahmas or the divine abidings. And this is a interesting and important label for these aspects because it indicates several things. One, it's important to remember that in certain suttas which speak to the Buddhist creation myths, um, namely the Aganya Sutta, human beings in the material realm are considered to be descended from the Brahmas in this particular mythology. And what I think that sutta is speaking to is the fact that in some sense, these qualities are more natural to us. Broad qualities of love and compassion are natural to the human heart in a sense. And the Brahmas, these gods in the mythology are portrayed frequently as having four faces. And similarly, the Brahma Viharas are divided into four aspects. The first metta, translated usually as loving kindness is a, or goodwill, is a broad sense of goodwill towards all beings. And this manifests in different ways, depending on the situation of the beings that it encounters. So when it encounters someone who's suffering, it manifests as the second of these four, karuna or compassion, the wish that their suffering become less or alleviated when it encounters a being who is in good stead and happy, it manifests as gladness, mudita, sympathetic joy, rejoicing in another's well-being or good action. And in every Buddhist list or almost every Buddhist list, there's usually a representative of wisdom. And the same is the case for the Brahma Viharas. So the fourth face of Brahma, the fourth Brahma Vihara is Upeka or equanimity, what Bhante Analio translates as equipoise, a sense of being willing to acknowledge that all beings are the owners of their kama and a willingness to at times step back when we can make no difference. So just as the Brahmas in this mythology look out onto the world with these four faces. So these four orientations of the heart provide a indication of how as practitioners, we can approach the world. So often Buddhism gets misinterpreted as a negative worldview because it takes as its fulcrum the Four Noble Truths, the first of which is the truth of dukkha, suffering or stress. Yet, in some sense, in many senses, this is a tragic misinterpretation of the Buddhist path because it is one of light and care at its most fundamental. 
in the mythological image of the Brahmas in Vedic and some areas of Buddhist cosmology, they're portrayed as sitting on a flower. So this is the abode of the Brahmas, is this flower. And if one sees that the flower grows naturally and spontaneously from the soil and from a grounding in a structure of morality and other aspects of the path, then one begins to understand why the Buddha didn't feel it as necessary to emphasize only these aspects of love, but also to stress the foundation of the heart and of practice, which allow us to cultivate well the ground of, in which such a flower can be planted and can grow. And these aspects of the heart are essential. One of the taints or the reasons for our human foibles and failings and clinging in Buddhist thought is a quality called upadana, which can be translated as attachment or feeding. And just as a flame feeds on a log or piece of wood. And Ajahn Su Chitto mentions frequently how the chitta, which is the Buddhist word for the mind and the heart, is constantly moving into the world with a sense of looking to feed off of it. And it is inevitably not satisfied because the chitta, the, our hearts aren't creatures of the world, of the sense realm. They can never gain a sense of satisfaction or lasting well-being from the shifting circumstances around us. And yet so frequently we don't know where else to turn. So we constantly look to the external circumstances for that sense of well-being. We constantly reach into a liquid looking for a solid. So what the Buddhist path tells us is that when we move into the world, we work to move into the world with a sense of may this be well, of blessing, instead of feeding we give instead of try to get. And this is a fundamental shift in our orientation towards the world. And yet there, what other reason is there to move out into this realm which we live other than as a gift? And in a sense, this is the essential implication and resonance in the long term of cultivating these boundless abodes, these loving abidings, is more and more one is able to move into the world with a sense of blessing instead of taking. And ironically, because of that giving, one finds oneself filled and fulfilled. There's another counterintuitive aspect to this whole process, however. And that's that as anyone who's practiced loving kindness realizes and quickly comes to realize, it's not as simple as simply spreading love and loving kindness outwards. <clears throat> that's an important aspect is to cultivate uh, a sense of loving kindness, of compassion, of sympathetic joy of equanimity actively in meditation through bringing to mind those we love repeating phrases of loving kindness but 
so frequently. It's more complex. Ajahn Amaro references the fact that to practice metta well, we need to be quick on our feet. Because although we tend to want to sort of shoot metta rays out at people um, and spread metta their way, we are often the ones that are bruised ourselves. And unless we first and repeatedly remember to turn our attention inwards to our own heart's tenderness, bruising, and dukkha, then there's a falsity um, or a forcedness to the spreading of loving kindness to others and outwards. One of the Buddha's categorical teachings, which is applicable in all situations, is the Four Noble Truths. And there's these Four Noble Truths each come with a task. Suffering is to be comprehended. The cause of suffering craving is to be abandoned. The cessation of suffering, peace, is to be realized. And the path to that peace is to be cultivated. There's a reason for this ordering, I think, in that our first step so often needs to be the task of that first noble truth, to turn towards and acknowledge our own difficulty and pain. And only then, once we've realized our own hurting, can those aspects of letting go, of peace, and then of the path, a more active aspect truly manifest without it being spiritual bypassing. So whenever beginning a metta practice or a metta retreat, I think it's important first just to sit in silence for a time with one's own, with one's heart and feel its own quality. Maybe it's tired from the past weeks of holding so many duties and people. Maybe it's bruised. Maybe it's disappointing or disappointed. And to let that to touch that for a time, to comprehend your own suffering, to engage in the first noble truth and its task. Because if you jump straight to very active cultivations of loving kindness, it tends to be like trying to jump straight to the fourth noble truth in a sense of cultivating the path very actively, but you haven't passed through the dark valley yet. You haven't seen what's closest to you. So that's a useful thing to remember starting into such a retreat is so often we ourselves are the ones who truly need this care right at the beginning. And I believe this is why the Buddha pointed to the Four Noble Truths again and again and to suffering, dukkha, as the beginning step for so many aspects of the path to acknowledge it because we don't have trouble rejoicing and recollecting love and these bright qualities. What we have trouble is turning towards the dark and letting it just sitting with it for a time, just sitting with it. And there's so much to be said for that. So returning to the metaphor of the flower, it's the willingness to break through that dark ground and let the roots of the flower grow down into that soil of sorrow and suffering because that is our shared humanity at its most essential. But it's also not the romantic side of things. It's less romantic to look towards our own failings and our own disappointments and to sit with them than to actively try to cultivate these bright states right off the bat. But we need to do that first because only if we have sunk those roots into that dark soil of the first noble truth can we expect that natural growth of the flower upwards 
of the Brahma Viharas that will manifest in the mind to truly gain the grounding they deserve and need. And the other aspect is Ajahn Sona is fond of saying that if one cultivates sila or morality, that one can then just crack a window and the breath of metta, of loving kindness, will enter of its own accord. And the Karaniya Metta Sutta, which many of you will know, it's interesting to note that it's at its most essential a list of qualities one cultivates before engaging in metta practice. Qualities such as uprightness, gentleness, being one of few duties, few wishes. And this is like the trellis upon which that plant grows, the flower of loving kindness. And I think we all have the experience of meeting those who have such love in their hearts. And yet, because there aren't, there isn't this robust structure available, it tends to become compounded on itself and not have the chance to grow in the bright and vibrant way it deserves. So much of this metta practice is really based on the simple and not terribly necessarily romantic acts of sitting meditation every day, keeping the precepts, um, keeping a good sense of morality, cultivating carefully one's actions in life. This is the trellis upon which it grows. And the third thing to mention is that once again, returning to the Four Noble Truths as the, as the basis for this whole practice, we need to switch from this ethic of feeding to an ethic of blessing. We need to be able to have an inner wealth to give. We don't realize how sick we are personally. So often when we start practice or duck out of a social interaction to go meditate, those around us dis can dismiss it as a selfish or self-absorbed act. But nothing could be further from the truth because what we're doing when we step out of the dinner party a little early to go home and meditate alone or wake up earlier to sit in silence is we're cultivating a brightness of the heart and an inner wealth and a skill which allows us to stop clinging and feeding on others with a white knuckled grip and instead be able to be with those we love with and really let them be as they are because we have a, an inner wealth as we that we that is enough it's a bit like a candle flame if it's constantly being hit by gusts of wind and interaction, it sputters constantly. Only if we cultivate that center of silence every day of meditation, of stillness, of a meditation object and of a path with purpose, does it have a chance to grow in brightness in that still spot. So this is the part of our practice that corresponds to that third and fourth noble truth of realizing peace and cultivating the path is that when we learn how to interact with the breath, when we learn how to find this robust sense of happiness within, then we're able to have something to give. So these are important things to keep in mind when we start onto a retreat like this and, do, and into a practice of loving kindness in general is we want to access these states of brightness and beauty. 
and we should cultivate them. My teacher, Ajahn Anand, recommends every Westerner begin with 10 minutes of metta practice at the beginning of their sits um, with our Judeo-Christian upbringing, so many of us, and our consumerist culture, uh, our sense of guilt and self-recrimination and self-hatred in a sense is an enormous obstacle to these states. But as we cultivate this in these bright states, they will pervade our lives. Another word for the boundless, for the Brahma Viharas is the boundless qualities of heart. And they do slowly move out into our lives and into the world. So it's important to turn our minds to them, to cultivate them slowly and consistently. And to also realize that to do so, we need to encounter first our own dark valley in the heart. Um, we need to take that time to sit. We need to cultivate this robust and deep grounding for that flower of loving kindness. We need to cultivate a trellis upon which it can grow and an inner wealth which we can give to those we love and those around us. And we need to understand that this is something that takes a while and yet it is a responsibility of us as practitioners. And it is something that yes, is cultivated largely during our formal practice, but it is by no means selfish. So that's a basic, uh, a few words on metta in general. And now Ajahn Kobilo will, I think, begin into a guided meditation and then a talk. <laughs>